Okay, good. So let's get started. Um, so this morning we'll talk about RNA velocity and we'll see how to, what it is, about how to calculate it, uh, why you would do it, and, and what are the things that you may need to uh, keep in mind. But before we talk about what uh, it is and how you would do it, uh, we'll say a few words about um, why we would like to do it. So if you have um, read some papers or heard about RNA velocity, you probably have seen uh, figures like this. And this is typically the, what you would get in the in the end when you have done like an RNA seq uh, RNA velocity analysis. So you will get things like the the, the figure here to the left, uh, where you have these streamlines that represent the uh, the flow uh, in this data set. So the way you would interpret this is that the points here are cells. So this is a a, a TSNI plot or a UMA plot or, or some kind of low dimensional embedding, and to see how the, um, the cells are kind of developing or moving in this um, uh, in these plots, you will basically follow this, this streamline. So you would see that over here, there is some cycling going on. There are cells uh, that are uh, still uh, in the cell cycle. Uh, and then at some point they will go out of the cell cycle and they will start uh, differentiating here. They will go through uh, these cells, these pre-endocrine pre cells, and then eventually um, decide what type of uh, differentiated cell they would like to become. So that's a very typical um, plot that you would see from an RNA velocity analysis. And of course, we will see how to uh, generate them uh, today. Uh, what you also often see is um, our plots like this. We look at individual genes. Um, and these are often referred to as phase plots or phase um, uh, trajectories. Uh, and basically they, they show the uh, amount of spliced uh, RNA and the amount of unspliced RNA, and then the, the um, velocity trajectory through them. So we will see how to make that as well and how, uh, what they mean and how to interpret them. Um, so that's kind of where we want to get to uh, at the end of this. So the, then to the question of why we would like to do this um, and why not just use the, the data we already have, uh, so when we do most of the single cell analysis, we just look at the, or just, but we look at the, uh, the RNA, the abundance profile, the gene expression profile of each cell. So that will tell you the abundance of the mature RNA for each gene in each of the cells. So that's what you would estimate, for example, if you ran Alevin, like Avi showed yesterday, or if you ran uh, Cell Ranger or uh, another quantification tool. So that's usually very good to figure out, like, uh, in what state is the cell, what's it doing right now, which other cells are it similar to, uh, but it doesn't really tell you where the cell is headed. So it doesn't really say in what state it would be like a little bit into the future. So that's the idea of the, of the RNA velocity that to use the, the snapshot data, because of course it would be better if we could take the same cells and just sequence them over time, then we could really see what happened to this cell uh, one hour in the future or a little bit into the future. We can't do that with the current uh, single cell rna -seq protocols. We have to take a snapshot and then the, cell, the cells are gone. Um, so this, the RNA velocity is a way to kind of try to get to the dynamics without having to look at actual time series uh, of uh, single cell data, of the same cells. So uh, then, what is it? Well, the, the underlying model, the kind of conceptual model is uh, what's shown in this figure here. So the whole idea is to use uh, not only the mature RNA, but also the unspliced or the pre-mRNA abundance in the cell at this point in time in order to say something about where the cell is heading. So kind of on a high level, you can imagine that if there is, for a given gene in this cell, if there is much more unspliced RNA or pre-mRNA than mature RNA, you can imagine that probably this gene is about to be upregulated because there is much more like, it is a lot of precursor RNA. Uh, and oppositely, if there is a lot of uh, mature RNA, but very little uh, pre-mRNA, probably this gene is about to be downregulated because there's not just, there's just not enough uh, in the pool of, of pre-mRNA to keep this expression level uh, up. So that's kind of the idea of 
uh, why having both the pre-mRNA and the mature mRNA will help to say something about where the cell is headed. So if you combine then this information across all the genes you're looking at, you will be able to say, where do I think this uh, cell will be uh, sometime in the future? So the conceptual model underlying the RNA velocity calculation is, is uh, shown here. So you have like your DNA, uh, which is being transcribed with some kind of transcription rate, which can depend on which state the cell is in. Either this gene is actually being transcribed or it's not. So that doesn't have to be constant. Uh, so the transcription generates this unspliced uh, RNAs that will uh, represented by U at a specific time T. Uh, and this is then being spliced with some splicing rate beta, which is uh, assumed to be a, a constant for all the cells uh, for each gene. So it can be different across genes, but it's constant across cells and over time. And when it's spliced, it turns into the spliced RNA or the mature RNA. Uh, which we represent by S, and this is then being degraded with some uh, rate constant gamma. So this is like the, the conceptual picture, and if we translate that into uh, mathematics, we get this system of uh, ordinary differential equations. So the first one just says that the rate of change of the unspliced RNA um, is the, the transcription will increase it, right? So the, the, the more is being transcribed, the higher, uh, this, the faster this uh, unspliced RNA will change. And then it's decreased by the splicing. So the, the more, the, it, the faster it's being spliced, the slower it will actually increase. Uh, the second uh, equation says the same for the, the spliced RNA. So the, this term here is the same as this one because whatever is spliced from the, the U uh, the pre-mRNA pool will go into the, uh, the mature mRNA pool. Uh, and then this is the degradation term. So uh, the faster it degrades, the slower this will uh, increase. So this is the whole kind of mathematics that's behind the, the RNA velocity. These are the equations that we would, uh, would like to solve. Uh, so what we do is that we input the values of U and S for our different for our, uh, cells. So this is the, the spliced abundance and the unspliced abundance. We will see how to estimate that as well. Uh, and then we're trying to estimate these parameters. Basically. So the alpha, the beta, uh, and the gamma. And then the RNA velocity by definition is this. So by definition, the RNA velocity is the rate of change of the mature mRNA. So that it's nothing uh, magical. It's really just uh, this. Thing. Um, and of course, if we now have all these parameters uh, and we have, we, we have the measurements of the U and the S, we can calculate the RNA velocity. So yeah, so this is the, the equations that we're trying to solve. And I wanted to uh, illustrate this. I made a little uh, app that we can run. So you can run this too if you want. Uh, it's uh, in the advanced single-cell RNA seq RNA velocity plot velocity app. So since this is not something that you will actually um, modify, you can run it from here. If you want to modify it, please copy it uh, also out to your working directory. But if you just open the app.r file and you click uh, run app, that should work. Uh, so it should open this one. So this is just to kind of illustrate what, uh, what this means. Uh, so we have this, these equations again. These are the same two equations that we had in the slides. Uh, and we're just going to assume that in the, at time zero, uh, we don't have any expression of this gene. So it starts from not being expressed. It, it can start from anywhere else, of course, but uh, we're just going to uh, assume that it, there is no expression of this gene to begin with. So we can actually solve this uh, set of equations explicitly. The, if you uh, want to have a look at what the solution actually looks like, like written out, uh, you can check this, this paper. So this is the SC Velo paper, uh, and they actually write out the, the equations, uh, the, the solutions to these equations uh, explicitly. So we will assume that beta and gamma are constant over time, uh, but that potentially the, the transcription rate can change uh, mm -hmm. depending on whether the cell is in an, oops, What's happened? It crashed. Okay, let's 
to again. Uh, so the transcription rate can potentially change depending on whether uh, the cell is in an active state or uh, in a, I mean, if this cell is, this gene is actually being transcribed or not. So let's look at what, what we see here. So um, this plot down here just shows the current alpha. So here we're actually assuming that the transcription rate is constant. It's always 20, which is a, a arbitrary number, but here it's it's the important thing is that it's it's constant. What this one uh, plot here shows is the uh, the actual solution. So the U of T is the blue. So this is the unspliced abundance, and S the red here is the spliced abundance over time. If we solve these equations, uh, what are the actual time uh, course? Uh, the, the profiles that we get. And here uh, we see the, the spliced abundance versus the unspliced abundance. So this is the phase plots that you would, that you, <sighs> okay, I will just run it locally. I'm not sure why it's crashing. Um, okay, so this is the same thing. Um, yeah, so this is the, the, the plots that we saw in the first slide, just showing for uh, all now all the time points, the spliced abundance versus the unspliced abundance. So the first thing uh, that we can see is that, so we start here at zero, zero, so that's the initial conditions. And then as transcription starts, this, both the spliced and the unspliced abundance start going up. But the unspliced abundance goes up first, which makes sense, right, because it, for, to get to the spliced abundance, you actually have to go through the unspliced state. So the blue curve goes up first, and then a little bit later follows the red curve. So that's the first thing that, that this kind of uh, makes sense uh, in the interpretation. Uh, the second thing we can notice is that eventually both of these will uh, become flat. So both of these will get into a steady state or an equilibrium where actually they don't change anymore. So eventually, if the transcription rate is constant, we will end up in a steady state where both of these derivatives uh, are zero, right? And the actual value of this uh, of the abundances here in the steady state will depend on the parameter. So if we change beta to uh, 0.5, um, you see it's actually different, right? So the ratio between them is different and the actual values are different. But the behavior is the same, so eventually, uh, it's going to go into a steady state if we leave it in a, a state with a uh, with a constant uh, a transcription rate for long enough. And the way we would see that here in the in the phase plot is so we, we start here. So this is the initial condition: s is zero and and u is zero. And then as time passes, we will start walking up this curve here. So uh, you see that u is always like increasing faster than, than s, which you can also see here. And then eventually we will end up up here, which is the steady state. So um, that's, that's kind of uh, how, how these ones would, would be interpreted. These, these, thing, these points that are above the line here, we will see just in a second what this line is. Um, these points that are up here are in uh, uh, points in that are representing cells that are in a state of where this gene is being induced. So corresponding to this uh, region here where the expression is actually increased. Pan, are there any questions at this point? Or anyone else has a question? No, that I can see. So let's quickly go back to the, the slides. Um, I wanted to just so how, so okay, so this is all fine, but can we actually use this to calculate the velocity? Um, so we saw that the point up here, the point up here are the steady state points. So the equilibrium point. And equilibrium, we saw that that meant that the uh, S and T were both constant. So the rate of change of the spliced abundance is zero. So if we just look at the equation that we have here, that means that beta u minus gamma s is zero. So in other words, beta times u equals gamma times s. So in the steady state, this will have to hold because the, change, the rate of change of, of s is zero. 
And if we now just divide by the beta on both sides, we get that u in the steady state, u is uh, proportional to s with a proportionality constant gamma over beta. Right? So that means that if we know that these points here up here are the in, in steady state, so if we know that we let this um, process run for long enough so that there, there will actually be some cells that have reached steady state, we can actually calculate this, ra this um, ratio because that will be the, the slope of this line that goes through the steady state point and zero, zero. So this particular line here is uh, gamma over beta times s. So um, we, can, we can actually estimate this ratio directly from the data if we can assume that there are some points, some cells uh, that eventually reach steady state or that we eventually reach steady state. Right. So, okay, so that's all fine. Um, but how does that, how do we get the velocities from that? Well, if we, uh, if we now look at any point on this curve, so this point here uh, is the coordinate, so the x coordinate is s of t and the y coordinate is u of t. So this is just the spliced and the unspliced bundles at a given um, time, given point in time. If we now look at the point that it's just below, so if we take the same x coordinate, but the value on this line, the x coordinate is the same. And the y coordinate now, since this line is y equals gamma over beta times x, the y coordinate here is gamma over beta times the x coordinate, which is s. So if we take the distance, the uh, vertical distance between this point and this point, between any point on the curve and the corresponding point on the on the line it's u of t which is this one minus gamma over beta times s of t which is this y coordinate which is actually proportional to the velocity so this is just if we multiply this side by beta we actually have the velocity so that means that if we can assume that these points uh, that we have some points in steady state we can estimate the gamma over beta ratio and from that, we can get this line. And from that, we can actually get the velocity estimate for each point on this phase plot. Right? We just take the, the distance from that point on the phase plot down uh, vertically to this line. Does this make sense? Uh, or are there questions on that? So basically, this is what um, what Velocito is doing. So the original tool that was uh, built to to do uh, RNA velocity estimation. This is what they're doing. They're they're assuming that there are some points up here. They're estimating this uh, this slope, <clears throat> and then they get the velocities uh, by taking the the distance to that line from this uh, phase plot plot that we will get from the data. Then of course there are some <coughs> some additional um, uh, code to kind of make this more stable, more robust, and to uh, somehow uh, make it uh, also applicable uh, in some sense to to genes that don't necessarily reach steady state. But this is kind of the basic idea. Uh, and I wanted to just show one more thing uh, here. So uh, now, so here we assume that the, the transcription is constant. But what if it uh, it just stops at some point? So it's it's transcribing for a while, and then it will stop. So we can change that here. Uh, we can set the the transcription rate type to two states. So that will mean that it's transcribing for a while, and then it's stop. It stops. Uh, and we can just uh, make this a little bit longer. Okay. So so here it's it's uh, the transcription rate is. <coughs> 20 for the first 10 time units, and then it's, it stops. So you see that the, the beginning in the beginning, it looks exactly the same as what we had before, which makes sense because there's no way the system will know that this will stop transcribing at some point. Uh, but as the, at the point where it actually stops transcribing, uh, the abundances are gonna start going down. And they're gonna go down in an exponential fashion and in the same way as the, the unspliced abundance went up first before the spliced one, 
the unspliced abundance will also go down a bit ahead of the, the spliced one. So you get the, the unspliced abundance go down, and then a little bit later, the spliced abundance will go down. Sorry, Charlotte, we have a question from Elrike, who is asking, what is the time unit? Yeah, so this is a little bit um, arbitrary here. So this is just like a, a, a model. Uh, and also this values 20 here is, is an arbitrary number just to make, just to show the, 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 the process. Um, so in, in reality, time, the time unit is actually a bit difficult. So it, what you get out of the, of the tools will also be somehow arbitrary. If you actually want to say that after one hour, this is where I think I am, you will have to impose some kind of um, knowledge about that because the system doesn't know, um, uh, let's say how, you, you're gonna get something that's proportional to the correct time. Uh, and if you, this, because the data doesn't know whether this going from here to here takes one hour or if it takes two hours, it's just gonna, give you back things that are internally consistent but the, the time may be uh, off by a by a proportionality factor and we have one more question from sina who is asking where do the beta and gamma parameter estimates are coming from uh so they they come uh i'm not sure i i understand uh the question so the 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 estimates here are coming from taking so up here is the steady state uh, if you draw a line through that point and zero, zero, you get a line with um, slope gamma over beta. So that will let you estimate the ratio between them. And one more thing, which is uh, from Alison, asking whether we have the same alpha uh, estimation for all the genes. Nope. And also the beta and the gamma are not the same for all the genes. Uh, so Velocito assumes that beta is the same for all the genes. And that's basically so that they can estimate not just the ratio, but the actual gamma. So Velocito sets beta arbitrarily to one, which basically assumes that the splicing rate is the same for all the genes. Uh, and of course, if you, if you have gamma over beta to 1.5 and you set beta to one, then you have also gamma because gamma will be uh, the 1.5. Um, so SC Velo will not make that uh, assumption. They will actually allow all these parameters to vary between genes. You will estimate them for each gene separately. Okay. Okay, great. So um, what I wanted to show here was that now that we kind of go first up and then down, we get these phase plots that, that look a little bit more like maybe what you see in, in the real data. So, so this part here is the induction part. So this is where the, uh, the uh, transcription rate is non-zero. So that, uh, in, in that period of time, it will first in, uh, increase the gene expression. So this gene is being uh, induced. Then up here, uh, it will be in the steady state. So depending on when this uh, the decrease in transcription rate comes, it will stay in this steady state up here for some time. And then once the transcription ends, uh, we're gonna go down in expression and then that's where we are in the repression phase, which uh, in which case we are below this uh, line here. So we can estimate the velocity in the same way as uh, I showed on the slide. So we take a point here uh, and we take the distance to the, to the line. So for all these points, the velocity is positive, which makes sense because here actually the gene expression is increasing, right? So the, the velocity is the rate of change of expression. So if the velocity is positive because the curve is above the line, then the gene expression is gonna increase. Here, if we take this point minus this point, it's actually this distance or this uh, value will be negative, which means that the the RNA velocity is negative, uh, which means that the, R, the gene expression is actually decreasing. So that's what's happening here. Right, Salud. so if, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, we have uh, two more questions. One is about the genes where we don't have uh, intron or unspliced formation. So I guess these cannot be estimated for. This is a question from Sebastian. Uh, and also there's a question from Simon who's asking if there is any experimental conf confirmation of the profiles that are reconstructed by, by Velocito, I guess on the original paper is the question. 
so yeah so for the genes that don't have uh, any introns we we can't do this uh, because we don't know whether what we're measuring is uh, spliced or unspliced uh, i mean it's the same and whether there's experimental confirmation of, of these um, kind of profiles or exactly yes I mean, I guess experimental confirmation. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. It's more like you 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 see these kind of patterns, uh, and then you fit a model to that, uh, and the model fits the data uh, reasonably well. And there is a like a mathematical model underlying. Uh, if they actually looked, I mean, you can't look over time in a specific cell. So that's kind of the problem. You need to. Um, uh, you need to make assumptions about your data in order to say something because there is no way you can really validate what's going on with single cell RNA seq data. But their trajectories did make sense in terms of what was known of the biological systems that they were studying. Yes. So overall, kind of the they, they got signals or or uh, profiles patterns that that made sense biologically, um, and the genes that came up kind of made sense biological too, but I don't think they, they could actually go in and validate afterwards a specific gene. It's more on the interpretation um, side, like, yes, this gene we knew about before, it makes sense in this, uh, in this context. Okay, good. So uh, then the, the, the last uh, thing I wanted to show here is then what happens if we, if it doesn't, uh, if we don't, let this trans transcribe for long enough. So if this is only now transcribing for a very short time, and then it goes down, we don't have actually time to reach the steady state. So you see this, this has actually stops uh, increasing and starts decreasing before it goes into the steady state. And this is where the, this model, uh, this way of estimating uh, velocity that is used by, by VeloCycle and also by the steady state model in SEVelo actually break down. Because here, this is this line is the true line. This is what we would like to estimate. Uh, but if we would just take the, the cells here in the in the top of the plots um, and say that I think this is my steady state, we would actually overestimate this rate. Uh, so this is where the the dynamical model uh, of Estivello that we will uh, use later and that we will uh, that actually solves this set of equations where that has an advantage because it can deal with this, uh, um, with this situation uh, without having to assume that whatever is on the top right of this plot will uh, be the steady state. Charlotte? Yeah. Uh, one more question from Julien, who's asking, what is uh, the effect of having single nuclei data instead of single cell data on the estimation of velocity? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think the, this is still being debated. Um, so in one way, you can say we have much more intronic reads typically in single nucleus data. So it should be easier. Uh, the kind of the intronic uh, expression, uh, unspliced expression is much higher. Um, on the other hand, you, so, so there kind of the degradation would maybe rather be like um, uh, export from the nucleus or something like that. Uh, and maybe it's not really clear if the uh, assumptions are satisfied. So is that uh, nuclear transport uh, rate constant across the cells, across the states? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if one can make that assumption. Um, is, uh, so so I, think, I think it's possible. Uh, and uh, I think both the, the developers of Velocito and Esivelo have done it and said that it seems to work, but both have also said that uh, they're not directly making guarantees. Right? So there are still things that we need to learn about uh, single nucleus data. It wasn't developed directly for that, um, but basically it seems to work. Okay. Okay. So Let's go back. So this is kind of uh, an overview of what, uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, what these plots mean, uh, how we can use them uh, and, and interpret them. 
So let's go uh, into what we would actually need to do to estimate these velocities. Um, so as I said, we actually need both spliced and unspliced abundance to go into uh, to solving these equations. So we can't use the, the regular gene expression uh, estimation pipeline that you saw yesterday uh, afternoon, for example, because that will only give you the spliced or the, the mature uh, RNA abundance. Uh, there are tools now that are um, developed for estimating both spliced and unspliced uh, abundances. I'm going to focus on the ones that work for, for droplet single cell RNA seq data, um, also because that I think has been a, a little bit more studied. Um, so, as you also heard yesterday, there are like different categories of these uh, quantification methods. You have the ones that align to the genome, uh, and you have the ones that align to some or map to some form of transcript. So in the genome alignment category, we have uh, velocito, or actually it assumes that the data has been uh, aligned to the, to the genome, for example, using cell range. Uh, and also star solo will, will do that. It will align the reads to the genome. And then basically, once you have the, aligned the reads to the genome, you have something like, like this figure here. So this black line is the genome. These red things here are the reads. And then this is a gene with exons and introns. So uh, once you have aligned the reads to the genome, you would basically count everything that falls always in an exon, uh, like these three reads here, will be exonic or uh, spliced. Reads like this ones that are always in an intron uh, will be counted as uh, unspliced. Uh, and then depending on uh, which tool you use and which settings you use, uh, the other reads are going to be treated uh, in, in uh, somewhat different ways. So reads like this that partly overlap an exon here and partly an intron, and here it's actually completely intronic, will be typically counted as uh, intronic because it can't be uh, exonic because it overlaps the intron. Uh, reads like this that fall in an exon here and in an intron here, well, that depends on how uh, which settings you're using, but you may count it as intronic because it could be intronic. Uh, or you may actually throw it away. So there are a lot of different uh, ways of counting uh, reads here on uh, well, after you've aligned to the genome, uh, depending on how permissive you want to be, basically, with uh, reads that are not completely unambiguous. Um, for the transcript and mapping tools like Alevin uh, that you saw yesterday, and also Callisto bus tools, so they will both map to the transcriptom and estimate abundances. We can't use just the transcriptom. Uh, because that will only give you the, the mature RNA. So we have to somehow extend this transcriptome with uh, either introns or pre mRNAs. And we will see how to do that. But actually, we need to ask ourselves first what we mean by an intron. So in this case, um, again, extracting the transcripts is, is straightforward. You just take the exons of each isoform and you glue them together. But extracting the introns that we will want to add to our FASTA file that we will then index with salmon is not so easy. So you can imagine doing this in different ways, right? You can either take the collapse approach, which is here to the left, where you take all the transcripts of a gene and you collapse all the exons. And then you define the introns as whatever is left. So in this case, we would collapse these in exons here to a, a longer exon. Uh, this exon is this one, and then here we have actually the same method. And the introns would be just whatever is left. So the part from here to here, and from here to here. So that's one way of doing it, and that basically means that if a read could be either exonic or intronic, so if it falls here, we would prefer to assign it to an exon. So basically we have removed all the intronic parts that could be exonic. So it, it uh, indicates a preference for exonic assignment. The other option is to actually look at each uh, isoform separately and define the introns as the actual introns. So here we would have the three introns <coughs> that we would add to the, uh, the, the, the feature set. Uh, and um, yeah, they will overlap the, the exon here, uh, but uh, we will assume that, that Alevin can deal with that. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to mention here is this flanking sequence. So since um, reads that are intronic can potentially overlap an exon, the a nearby exon as well. So they can be partly exonic and partly intronic. 
uh, they don't have to be completely inside the intron to be unspliced. We add this flanking sequence uh, on each end of our introns just to allow for uh, these reads that are partly intronic and partly exonic to also be assigned uh, to introns. So once we have decided on, on what we want to consider an intron to be, um, we can make our FASTA file, we can expand, extend our FASTA file. So if we choose the collapse approach, the, the features that will actually go into the FASTA file that we will index by salmon uh, is the transcript. So these are the two isoforms, the, the exons glued together, and these two like uh, new uh, um, artificial introns. If we choose this approach, we have again the two transcripts. So these will always be the same. The, the transcripts uh, will not change depending on how we define the introns. But then we will have these three uh, original introns, including their um, uh, the flanking sequence. So once we have chosen, this is, uh, these are what we will put into the FASTA file and index with Salmon and then quantify uh, with Alevin. And I just, uh, before uh, the break, I just wanted to illustrate uh, a little bit of the, what the difference is that you may see if you uh, uh, quantify with different tools. Um, so there are mostly, well, mostly these four tools uh, currently that are uh, used for, for uh, RNA velocity quantification. And then you can use them with different options. So for example, for, for Alevin, which of these ones uh, do we choose? And additionally, do we quantify exons and introns jointly or separately? So do we take our data and first quantify the gene expression as usual and say that this is now my, my uh, spliced uh, abundance? And then we take the same data and independently uh, um, quantify the introns. So what would happen in that case would be basically that all these reads that fall in this region would be counted twice. Because when we just look at the, the, the transcripts, the exons, we will say, yeah, it could be exonic. So it's maps here, so I will count it as exonic. If we don't know about the introns at that stage. If we just look at the introns and don't know about the exons, we will say, yeah, it could be intronic, so I will count it to this gene too. So we will actually count many reads uh, twice if we quantify exons and introns completely independently of each other. But it's an option. Um, so I just wanted to show a few um, uh, aspects where the methods are different. Um, so what you see here is uh, an example of a gene. So here you have the gene model. Uh, this is on the negative strand, so this is indicated by the red color. This is the coverage uh, of the reads. So these are the reads that fall on the on the negative strand and the, those that align to the positive strand. Um, and as we saw uh, yesterday, the, the, the 10x data is actually uh, stranded, so all the reads that come from this gene should be on the same strand. Um, so here, uh, in these panels here, uh, I'm showing the, uh, the count, the spliced count, and the unspliced count for each of the methods. These methods here, you don't have to go uh, that much into detail on what they are right now. And this is the fraction of the reads that are unspliced. So the first thing we will see on this gene uh, is that there are actually a lot of um, ambiguous regions that could be either intronic or exonic. And in particular, this region where all the reads are, could be either exonic if we look on this isoform or intronic if we look in this. So this means that the way we define the introns actually makes a big difference. If we define the introns with the collapse approach where we just collapse all the exons first and take the introns to be whatever is left, this region here will not be intronic because it, it's exonic here. So when we collapse it, this region here will all be exonic. So in that case, this we see here, we actually get almost no unspliced reads for this gene. If, on the other hand, we define the uh, introns using the separate approach, uh, this region here could be intronic or could be exonic. And uh, as you see, Alevin will actually assign some of the reads uh, to the spliced as, as uh, spliced and some as unspliced. So um, it really makes a difference, right? Um, whether you can actually say which is correct is a different question. 
Um, and it depends on the gene. Maybe in this case, it seems to make sense that it's uh, exonic because it actually ends exactly at the end of this, of this exon. And this is the three prime end of, uh, of this transcript and this read should be in the three prime uh, end. Um, but you, in order to say which one is correct, you would actually have to look uh, at the gene and it's not even obvious uh, all the time which one, um, where these reads would actually come. But the point here is that it, it makes a difference and you actually need to check uh, your quantifications to, to see whether they make sense. The other thing Hello. that, yeah. Sorry, we have a question from Simon. Uh, just asking, um, what's the situation when you're dealing with uh, genomes that are not very well curated um, on the precision of the results? And uh, if there's any benefit in testing different versions of uh, genome annotations? Um, probably yes. I mean, you would have a, a, you would have problems. For example, I mean, all these tools assume, especially the ones that align to the or map to the transcriptome, uh, will assume that all the transcripts that could be uh, expressed are actually annotated. Um, you could have a problem if you uh, have a not very well annotated uh, genome, and there is a, another gene uh, here, for example, that's not annotated in the intron of another gene, uh, you will have, if that gene is expressed, you will have a big peak here that you will assign to the intron of this gene, whereas it would actually come from the unannotated gene. So it can uh, definitely um, lead to problems if you, if you have misannotations or uh, incomplete annotations. And I would also there, I mean, I, I would always, I think, recommend looking at plots like this for the genes that actually turn out to be the most important for your analysis, the ones that seem to affect the, um, the velocity calculations or the, uh, the streamlines, the, the, the path that you will get through your data. Okay. Um, right, so the, the other thing I wanted to just show here uh, is the difference between quantifying exons and introns together or completely independently. So that's the difference between, so the top bar here is quantifying them together. So basically letting them compete for the reads. Uh, and the second line here is quantifying them separately. So you quantify first the transcripts and then the introns. Uh, and you can see that actually uh, the, the, the fraction of unspliced reads is more or less the same, but you're basically double counting a large fraction of the reads because you don't, uh, you first just quantify the exons and then all these reads uh, will be exonic, and then you quantify just the introns, and then all these reads will be uh, intronic. Um, another way uh, that you also heard yesterday, uh, which in which these methods differ, uh, is in how they uh, deal with overlapping features or reads that map to multiple features. So this is a, a interesting gene. So here we have a gene here on the on the negative strand. It actually overlaps with another gene. So this slightly paler red here is a different gene on the same strand. Um, maybe this is a, a wrong annotation. Maybe it's actually the same gene, but in the annotation there, uh, it's written, it's given as a different gene. That's a different name. Um, so almost all these reads will actually map to both of these genes. And almost all the tools, except for Alevin, will just throw all these reads away, saying we don't know where they come from. Uh, so we're just going to toss them all away. Uh, whereas Alevin will try to uh, use, as you heard yesterday, the, the EM algorithm uh, to kind of try to figure out where, uh, where these reads come. And I think in this case, it, it seems to make sense that a lot of reads actually come from this gene because these reads here don't actually fit with this, um, this exon. But that's another uh, way in which the methods differ, the way they handle uh, overlapping genes or reads mapping to multiple genes. A related thing uh, that's specifically for Callisto bus tools uh, is that it doesn't uh, take into account the strandedness of the reads. So if you have a situation like this, where you have a gene on the positive strand and then another gene on the negative strand, uh, if you don't account for the strandedness of the reads, all these reads here uh, will actually be considered ambiguous again, since they overlap two genes. Uh, and be thrown away. So this is why Callisto bus tools here uh, don't assign these reads anywhere, but just toss them away. Whereas the other methods that account for the, the fact that this data is stranded 
will say they can't come from this gene because then they should have been on the other strand. Um, and finally, one thing that's specific or maybe specific to, to droplet data. So um, in, in Tenex data, for example, we have all the reads should ideally come from the, the three prime end of the transcripts, um, which means that in principle, we could imagine that instead of indexing transcripts and introns, we could imagine indexing transcripts and unspliced transcripts. So in not just the introns, but the entire unspliced transcripts. Uh, it seems that for droplet-based data, that's a little bit too uh, hard to actually estimate. So it's pretty difficult to say from just three prime data, uh, whether it comes from the spliced version of the, the isoform or the unspliced version of the isoform. It's easier to say whether it comes from uh, the exons or the introns. So there will be, with three prime data, uh, there seems to be a lot of, of genes that actually just get more or less half, half, Half the reads will be assigned to the spliced and half to the unspliced because there's no real way of, uh, of telling. So this situation may be different for full length data like SmartSeq data where we actually have reads along the entire transcript. Uh, so there it may be easier to use, um, uh, actually index the full transcripts and unspliced transcripts.